Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Wanda mentioned, my name is Ainsley, and I'm currently a PhD student in the School of Criminology at SFU. Um, and the research that I'll be presenting to you this afternoon was my master's thesis research, and it explored post-secondary students' experiences with homophobia and transphobia online. Um, so first I wanted to briefly talk about why I select this topic and why it was of interest to me. Um, so cyberbullying has been a really recently popular topic in the media. We see a lot of research in this field, but one thing that I was noticing as I started to look at it is that a lot of the research focuses on the elementary, middle, and high school years. Um, so not a lot of research looks at what happens after high school in both workplace settings and in uh, post-secondary school settings. And of the studies that I could find that looked at post-secondary cyberbullying, very few of them look explicitly at the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer population. So I was able to find some studies that did include these types of students, um, but they often just included their experiences as part of a larger student body. So um, they had students that fit this population, and their experiences seemed to be different from other students. So there was often a need to try to explain these differences, but they were often so such a minority in terms of the overall population that they couldn't take much from what they found. So there were some ideas about why the differences might exist, um, but there's not a lot of research explicitly in this area that just looks at the LGBTQ experience. Um, so I was able to find two studies that did explicitly look at this. Um, and so they looked at the LGBTQ student population as part of the larger student population, but they also tried to explain some of the differences in terms of prevalence of cyberbullying. So the first one um, was an American study conducted at the University of New Hampshire by Finn. And what he found was that um, LGB students were more than twice as likely, when compared to their heterosexual counterparts, to experience stranger-perpetrated cyberbullying. And this was particularly in the forms of stranger-perpetrated emails. And once students re uh, requested that these emails be stopped, they were also much more likely to continue to keep receiving these threatening emails. And the other study that I also found useful was an Australian study by Wensley and Campbell that looked at uh, university students. And one of the most interesting findings that they had was that the overall rates of cyberbullying among post-secondary students in their sample were very comparable to those found in middle school and in high school populations. So it definitely does lend support to the fact that this is not a phenomenon that just ends once you graduate high school. They also found that non-heterosexual men specifically were much more likely to be victims of multiple forms of cyberbullying and they were more than twice as likely um, when compared with heterosexual males. And they were the largest group studied uh, to have experienced cyberbullying. I'm, sorry, I'm sure you've talked quite a bit about cyberbullying and associated definitions today, so I won't spend too much time on this. Um, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that there's really not a widely agreed upon cyberbullying definition. Um, different research will employ different definitions, but there are some agreed upon points in a lot of the research. So, um, cyberbullying should be repeated, it should be intentional, um, understandably given the title it should be perpetrated through some form of information or communication technology, uh, it must result in some sort of harm, and it also must include a power differential. But the problem with all of these aspects is that in an online setting these take on different meanings. So the idea of something being repeated, someone may not intend for something to be repeated but if it gets sent out by other individuals or in other settings it can then become a repeated action. Um, as well, power can mean something different in an online setting. So power can relate to um, how technologically savvy you are rather than how big you are in an offline setting. So there are some nuances here that are a little bit different when you look at it from a cyberbullying context. Um, I also wanted to define homophobia and transphobia, just in case you're unfamiliar with these terms. Um, so homophobia can be defined as a fear or hatred of homosexuality and of gays and lesbians in general, whereas transphobia relates to fear or emotional disgust towards individuals who don't conform towards society's traditional gender expectations. And I'll go into this in a bit more detail as I discuss my findings. So um, on to what I did. Uh, so this study is very exploratory in nature because there really isn't a lot of research specifically looking at this population in the post-secondary setting. And I really just wanted to get an idea of what is happening. Um, so my major research question was, what are post-secondary students' experiences with homophobia and transphobia online? And some, some questions included what types of victimization they may have experienced in online settings, where in online environments they've encountered instances of homophobia and transphobia, 
And finally, through which methods are they victimized? So is it typically email? Is it in blog posts? I was really interested just in uncovering what was happening. Um, so my sampling was predominantly purposive. Uh, so I had some ideas in mind of uh, criteria that I wanted people to meet in order to be included in the sample. So the first one was that they needed to be currently registered at a lower mainland post-secondary institution. Um, they also had to be aged 19 or older. And they had to have either witnessed or personally experienced homophobic or transphobic cyberbullying. So I allowed here for witnessed uh, homophobia and transphobia, it didn't have to be experienced necessarily personally. They could have experienced secondary victimization in some way. And so my initial recruitment was through posters that I put up in different post-secondary settings and in queer-friendly spaces. Um, and then I also took out classified ads, both online and in traditional newspapers. And I was able to engage in some snowball sampling as well. So with some of my initial participants, um, they knew other individuals who fit the requirements for the study. So they then extended the reach. They put things up on their Facebook pages. They sent out emails. And I was able to get some additional participants that way as well. So this is what my final sample looked like. Um, so I had six participants that I engaged in in-depth interviews with. And I, this information here is all taken from a follow-up questionnaire that I gave to my participants following each interview. And it was a very open-ended questionnaire. And the reason for this was that I wanted people to be able to control their representation in the research as much as possible. They were able to select their own pseudonym that they felt best represented their identity. If they didn't want to pick one, I chose one for them. Um, and I asked them to identify their own sexual identity or orientation and their own gender identity. So if it says not identified, that means that they left it blank and I just respected that. I didn't want to put any labels on them if they weren't comfortable uh, giving themselves a label. And you'll notice some of the terminology is slightly different and that's just because this is verbatim what they put on that questionnaire to be as respectful as possible. So even though I only had six participants, I had a really nice range of different forms of orientations and identities. Um, so I was able to get a really well-rounded picture of what they were experiencing as well. So I conducted semi-structured interviews last year over several months, and these ranged in time from about 45 minutes until almost two hours. And they were predominantly open-ended interviews. Um, I had a guide that I followed, but if we went off topic, uh, we were able to talk about whatever the participants wanted to talk to, or, or whatever points they felt were most important. So I was able to go off script if necessary. And this provided some extra opportunity for probing about issues that they felt were really important and things that had really affected them. And then I also gave that follow-up questionnaire so that I could get some additional demographic data and expand on some of the things that we weren't, didn't have time to talk about in the interviews. So now on to what I found. Um, so in terms of just general internet use and where people tended to spend their online time, um, because these were students, all of them, and they also socialized a lot online, uh, they spent a minimum of five hours per day on the internet. So this involved mobile internet use on telephone, as well as school-based internet use and online socialization. And they used the internet for all types of things. So a lot of them used it for social networking, socializing. Every single person did that in some form or another. I also had two online gamers in my samples. They spent a lot of time in virtual worlds, or through Xbox Live playing online games. A lot of individuals use blogs regularly and they also use dating or pickup sites or applications. So in terms of where cyberbullying was encountered most, um, there were several venues that stood out as being particularly problematic. So the first of these was Facebook and this probably just relates to the fact that this is a really commonly used site among the participants. Um, discrimination on Facebook was very common. Bullying was carried out on this site through both public wall posts but also through private messages. And in this case, they always knew who the individual was. There were no forms of anonymous cyberbullying on Facebook. Um, YouTube was also discussed as being a particularly problematic venue. Um, there was lots of homophobic and transphobic speech. And this was oftentimes in the comments uh, posted in relation to videos about LGB or trans issues. So um, this may have been posted in relation to an individual's own video or a video posted by a friend or by an acquaintance. And then finally, as mentioned with the online games, um, there was a lot of homophobic slurs and language that were directed towards players in the game. So it was either directed towards players that were in some way identified as being LGBTQ or towards people who were simply bad at the game. So oftentimes these slurs were directed towards male players in a way of being demeaning or emasculating to say that they weren't playing the game up to other players' expectations. 
So in terms of definitions, um, one of the things that participants really pointed towards was the problems with current use of terms like cyberbullying, cyber harassment, and cyber victimization. So they all felt that the terms have some utility, but in some cases they are too broad and too all-encompassing. So if you hear that something is bullying, it can in include so many different types of behavior that sometimes it just isn't taken as seriously as it should be. And other times they felt that sometimes it was too narrow and it didn't encompass more subtle types of harm that they felt sometimes were, were actually were more harmful, but that there really wasn't a word to capture that. Um, they often felt that such terms were linked to childhood or adolescence, so they felt that this minimized the harm that they experienced because they were experiencing it as adults. Um, and many of them discussed the fact that we may need a more nuanced term uh, to capture all of these behaviors. Um, several of them referred the term cyber harassment to cyber bullying, um, particularly because this has a somewhat criminal connotation to it, so there's more seriousness often accorded to this term. Um, and they felt that as long as the behavior could fit within this term, it was a fine term to use. Uh, but Damon, one of my participants, did have some concerns about using this term because he felt that individuals are reluctant enough to accept a label such as bully, and he thought that it would be even harder to get people to admit to having harassed someone because it is a more charged term often. So one of the things that I was really mindful of is um, trying to also acknowledge the positive aspects of the internet, particularly for this population. Um, because there definitely are some great aspects to the internet and um, particularly for LGBTQ individuals, when they're establishing a new identity or a different orientation, oftentimes they perform a lot of investigation and formation in online settings because it's a lower risk setting. They don't necessarily have to adopt it offline with their friends and family members. Um, so several participants, particularly the trans individuals, talked about being able to investigate, test, and form online identities before they were okay with doing so offline. Um, because you can change out your persona, you can try out different things. They also talked about being able to find a community of supportive individuals online, and this was particularly helpful when they were just talking about either coming out and considering it or adopting a new identity. So um, they were able to find individuals that were like-minded and that came from similar places online when they weren't able to necessarily find them in an offline setting. And Damon particularly talked about the fact that it's difficult to form trans communities offline sometimes because um, the group may be very geographically dispersed or people may not be completely out as a trans individual. So being able to do that online brings that community together. So while there were certainly some positives, um, there were definitely lots of negatives as well. And one of the biggest ones was that everybody felt that there was no such thing as a safe online space. Um, there, Mercy felt that Facebook was fairly safe because you can control your privacy settings and you can sort of affect who you add and who you take off. But the problem with this is that the site always changes these privacy settings. So, and it also makes them difficult to change back. So you may think that your site is very safe and then realize that other people have access to it when you didn't think that you gave them access. Um, Damon also argued that Facebook is definitely not safe because the boundaries are not fixed and so you don't have total control over your account and your personal information. Uh, the blog site Tumblr was reported by many individuals to be a safer online space. Um, you're able to use trigger warnings on this site and to control who you follow. Um, so there is some potential to avoid harmful contact, but both Fox and Clark Kent talked about how hurtful information still managed to slip through the cracks on such sites, so there was no way to avoid it altogether. Okay, and so the final um, finding that I had that was particularly troubling was that there was a lot of in-group bullying um, in the LGBTQ community. So this was particularly experienced by trans participants, um, but it was also experienced, um, it was experienced by them, but either as part of the wider trans community or by members of the LGB community. So part of this related to unintentional bullying, where maybe LGB individuals didn't understand the specific specificity of trans issues. Um, but some of it was related to the norms expected in the trans community. So um, trans individuals bullied other trans individuals if they didn't fit the expectations. So for example, if um, someone who had transitioned to being male was also dating someone who identified as male, that was considered as being um, not acceptable. So a lot of times they experienced discrimination that way. Um, and as well, if they accorded more importance to different trans causes, this often led to rifts and fights in the wider trans community. So in conclusion, it's clear from these findings that not only does cyberbullying extend beyond high school, it definitely wasn't a rare occurrence. 
Um, I was able, I asked my participants to account, to recount either retrospective or recent experiences, and every single one of them was able to name at least one instance since high school, and most of them had experienced something within the past month. So it's clear that it was still happening, and it definitely wasn't rare. Um, it's also interesting to see the similarities and differences that emerge in experiences of trans participants who experience double or triple discrimination. So this is particularly concerning and it definitely warrants further research attention. Um, obviously this study is exploratory, so more research in general is needed in this area. And hopefully through additional research and with the cooperation of sites and internet service providers, we can head in a direction of providing safer online spaces for LGBTQ users and for all internet users. Thank you very much.